I'm running as fast as I can right now. I don't know if he's still chasing me. My life might be coming to an end. Oh no, is that him? Ah! Two months ago. Wow, Bayleaf. I can't believe we finally made it to Air Critique C. I said. Bayleaf Bay? My first Pokemon replied. Suddenly, we bumped into a strange old man with grey hair on the back of his head, blue eyes and a white shirt. He turned around and looked at us. Hello, just when you least expect it. I am Cameron, the photographer. Would you like a photo of yourself? He asked. There was something strange about this man. He was obviously about 70 years old, but he had the voice of a 20 year old. Also, he kept running in place like he had the energy to run a marathon. Um, sure, I said, trying to be polite. He took a picture. Everything seemed normal, except the flash of light was more grey than white. I just assumed it was an old camera and thanked Cameron. Then we parted ways. Or so I thought. I was in Blackthorn City, ready for my last gym battle, where a man stopped me. Hi again, Sol. It's me, Cameron, the photographer. Would you like another photo? I froze. Sol? How do you know my name? If Gold was here, he would use his quillava to burn Cameron's camera. I, on the other hand, let curiosity get the best of me. Letting him take a picture of me, Bayleaf, Entei, Raikou, and my shiny Gyarados. Again, he thanked me and walked towards the ice path. I thought I'd seen the last of him, but where was I wrong? A month later, I was the Indigo League champion and decided to start a journey in Kanto. I had my newly caught Lugia fly me to Pallet and start where my idol Red started his journey with his Charmander. I landed right behind Red's house. I almost fainted in fear. There he was, Cameron the photographer. But he looked different from the last two times I saw him. His hair was more of a light grey, and so was his eyes. Not only that, but he sounded 15, which I knew was impossible. Hello, Soul Silver. It's me, Cameron. Would you like a picture? I screamed. He just slipped out. But he not only knows my first name, but now my last name? If my cousin Blue was home, he would be literally killing this guy with his blast toys right now. Um, no thank. But I was interrupted by Cameron stealing my six Pokeballs and throwing them on the ground. Out came my Bayleaf, Lugia, Pikachu, Gyarados, Entei, and Raikou. Then he took a picture. Now the flash of the camera was dark grey. Thank you, he said. I ran to Viridian City as fast as I could, dodging every Pokemon I could. Once I got to my cousin's gym, he asked, Why do you look so scared, Sol? Afraid of our battle? I shook my head. Then what is it? My cousin Blue asked, sounding a little worried. I shook my head. It's, it's nothing. I lied. After our battle, which I easily won, I sat in the corner for a little while. After a while, Blue stared at me. Uh, Sol? You've been sitting there for an hour. Oh, have I? Okay, I'm sorry. I'll be going now, I said, leaving. After a while, I totally forgot about Cameron. I already beat the seven other gym leaders in Kanto, and even beat my idol, Red, on Mount Silver. My great-great-grandpa was the one to make it to the top first. That's why it's called Mount Silver. I decided to go back home, for I haven't been there in two months. When I got to New Barktown, I froze. Right in front of my house, was Cameron. THE Cameron. He looked very different though. His hair was now pitch black. His eyes were also pitch black. Except for two tiny neon red pupils. His skin was a light grey, and he was crying blood. His shirt was tattered and ripped. And this was the first time I realised that you could see his ribcage. 
Hello, Soul Charlotte Silver. I'm Cameron, the photographer. Would you care to have your photo taken? I started to cry in fear. He's only 12 now, and he even knew my middle name. I had enough. Without even thinking of getting Lugia to fly me far away or have Raikou carry me to Mount Silver at the speed of lightning, I ran as fast as I could. I didn't even stop to look if he was still behind me. I ran and ran as fast as I could. People from Cherry Grove City looked at me with a frightened look. I ran all the way to Ilex Forest where I collapsed. Suddenly, I heard a terrifying, ear splitting laugh. There's no point in running, my dear. Once I get your picture, you will never escape, he said. I tried to get up and run, but my body was stuck to the floor. He then tackled me and he grinned. His grin was larger than a normal human's. He also had razor sharp teeth and blood dripping from his mouth. Remember, my dear child, never trust strangers, he said. He bit my leg with razor sharp teeth. I screamed in pain. I woke up in the ruins of Alf, and I looked different. I had light grey skin and tattered and ripped clothes. You could see my rib cage. My eyes were pitch black with two neon red pupils. My hair was also pitch black, and I was crying blood. I could smile a lot larger than a normal human could. Standing in front of me was Cameron the photographer. Welcome to my family, my new daughter, he said. Behind him was about five boys, who were also victims and now sons of Cameron the photographer. He offered me a blood red camera. My soul was now corrupted by a monster. I took the camera and followed my new family deeper into the ruins. Remember, Whenever you see Cameron the photographer, run. I hope you're not in too big of a rush, because this is a long story. This is the story of how I lived, died, relived, and I'm going to die a final time. So let's get right into it. But before we begin, I'll tell you all this. This story is a warning to never let your Pokemon die by your hand because it will haunt you until you die by its hand. The story begins in Hoenn, more specifically, Little Root Town. I just turned 10 and got my first Pokemon from Professor Birch, my favorite Pokemon, Mudkip. As I went to Route 101, I encountered my first Pokemon, an Eevee. I wasn't sure if Eevees were common around here, so I was excited. My friend Brendan gave me a couple of his Pokeballs before we left Little Root, so I weakened the Eevee and used a Pokeball. One, two, three, gotcha! I decided to name the Pokemon I caught Julius, for no particular reason. I continued my journey on Route 101, when I discovered a family of Pokemon. It was a Glaceon, a Jolteon, and an Eevee. It seemed like they were looking for something, or someone. I thought about leaving them alone, but I had this urge to catch them. I immediately started throwing Pokeballs at them, and they jumped out of course, but then they started to attack me. I ran away from them and left them be. Then, all of a sudden, the gravity just reversed itself. I was being pulled out into space along with two other Pokemon. It was the Eevee and Jolteon from before. They didn't see me though, as they were trying to call out to someone on the ground. It didn't seem to affect the surroundings or nature at all though, or any other life form that lived in Hoenn. After a full minute of flowing upwards, gravity kicked back in. I was falling to the earth rapidly. I knew I was going to die on contact. In the last moment before I hit the ground though, I had thought of sending out Julius and my mudkit. I was close enough to the ground to send them out and be perfectly fine. But boy was I wrong. I didn't die on contact as I had expected to. I'd also noticed that we weren't in Route 101, but by a lake or some body of water. But it would have been better if I did. I looked around and saw Julius. I could tell he was in excruciating pain, because I saw what he looked like. 
His leg bones were shooting through his back. His skull was rather visible after what I think could be recoil damage, but its eyes were the most painful for me to see. They were piercing right through me, glowing with pain, fear, and most of all, hate. Hate for what I had done to it. Hate for knowing it was my fault. I saw those same eyes in myself every time I looked in the mirror, because I'd killed him. I'd taken his life. I then turned to see Mudkip. Surprisingly, he seemed just fine. I told him to go get help, and then he ran off. I haven't seen him again. I even turned back over to Julius to try and say sorry and goodbye. I was trying to hug him, give him one last bit of love and maybe even solace. Tell him that I was sorry for accidentally murdering him. But every time I tried to hug him, or even pet him, he would bite my hand. Every time I told him that he didn't deserve this and that I'm sorry, he would just turn away, despite the pain that it caused him. We both died before the ambulance arrived. Where am I? I asked myself. Who am I? I don't know. I I've forgotten everything. I see a Glaceon in the distance and think, maybe this Pokemon could help me. I got up. I'm incredibly short. And this was odd because I was sure I was a human. How can a 10 year old be three foot tall? I approached the Pokemon. Michael? Will? Julius? Where are you? She asks. Excuse me, I say. But who are you looking for? My family, yells the Glaceon. Ever since that weird gravity thing happened, I can't find them anywhere. I was by the ice rock here and trying to get my son to evolve to be just like me. I'm glad he didn't. I'm so selfish. I remember something very briefly. I start to remember the start of it. And for some reason, my name. What species are they? I ask, as I've forgotten even what Pokemon are which. Will and Julius are my sons, and they are both Eevees, states the Glaceon. My husband, Michael, is a Jolteon. I think they might have died. I'm so sorry, I say sincerely. I knew it, says the Glaceon, tears in her eyes. I just chose to have hope. Guess that hope was false. I'm sorry to ask this, but am I human? I asked the Glaceon bluntly. Of course not, laughs the Glaceon. You're a mudkip. Why would you think you were one of those monsters? A mudkip? I think to myself. How can that be? I tell her. I asked because I am, well, I guess I was a human. Then I recognize where I am. I'm in Route 101. Everything from my past life comes like a tidal wave. Me starting my journey, catching Julius, running from that Glaceon, and ultimately dying. Knowing that if I'd waited until I hit the ground, Julius would have been okay. Knowing that I'd murdered an innocent Pokemon. Really? Interrogates Glaceon as I come back to reality. Did you happen to know this one trainer around here? He tried to catch me and my family. I now realize that this is the Glaceon I'd met as a human. I tried to explain to the Glaceon that I was the trainer, and that I was selfish back then, and was sorry for what I'd done. I decided not to tell her that I'd caught Julius, one of her sons, and basically murdered him. She'd gone through enough for one day. She showed no anger as I explained, but rather compassion, as if she saw herself in me. She had forgiven me for what I did, and she'd invited me to stay with her as the night grew near. I accepted. It had been a long day for both of us, and before the sun even set, we were both asleep. I was falling. I hit, saw Julius and Mudkip. It was as if it had happened in real life. Then, right before I died, Glacial woke me up. She told me that I was screaming about Julius. She wondered who he was and asked me to provide details. I knew what I had to do. I told her everything. 
me catching Julius, the events from my perspective, the fall, and most painful of all, how her child had died. The Glaceon responded in a way that, to this day, I don't understand. She hugged me. I returned the embrace as you should, but... It's okay. It wasn't your fault, cries the Glaceon. You had no idea, I then told her. It was my fault, and that's why I've decided to go out on my own. All I do is create pain and suffering to those close to me. I can't bear to see anyone else get hurt. I left the den before she could protest. Even as she chased after me, she didn't have enough endurance to keep up with me, and I escaped. Ever since then, I've tried talking to my deceased Pokemon, trying to tell it that I never wanted this. I never wanted to be his killer, but every time I do, I have the same response in my head. You will never be forgiven. You made me like this. So I will slowly take you the same way. I can only assume that this is Julius. I've even tried to reunite with my short-lived friend by means of someone else killing me, or me killing myself, but every time I do, I'm revived into this form. Mudkip used to be my favorite Pokemon. Now, it's anything but. I can only imagine what Julius has planned to kill me, but I know it will be soon. Because today, my message had an added line. Just like me, you will be short-lived. But no matter how soon that is, it will have come too late. I just hope that by him killing me, we'll both be able to rest. Who knows, maybe once he kills me, I'll have a second chance of saving him. So, this is my story. If you're somehow reading or listening to me, I'm glad that you now know. You know my story. I know the warning that comes with it. But I fear this is the end, right here. Why you may ask? Because I see a ghostly figure on Espion. The form that I would want Julius to have taken once he evolved. And I'm not where I was before. I'm back at the lake. The lake where we died. So as my life comes to a close, my message to you is don't make my mistake unless you want to die a gruesome death twice. I was in fifth grade and everyone in my grade loved Pokemon. That is, everyone except me. I hated Pokemon since first grade when everyone started trading cards. I thought it was pathetic, but then, on my 11th birthday, I received a copy of Super Smash Bros. for my Wii. My brother became obsessed with Pikachu, so I thought I'd try the character. Then, I started watching the anime and ended up with a huge obsession. Then the next day I decided it was time to try my first Pokemon game, Pokemon Soul Silver. I wanted Heart Gold, but Soul Silver was the only one left. It didn't matter to me. So, right when I got home, I put the game into my DSi and started playing. I chose Chikorita and soon caught many Pokemon. I loved the game, and it became my favorite game on the DS, replacing Animal Crossing Wild World. Not long after I started the game, right after defeating Faulkner, I received a message. A text box popped up saying, oh? I wonder what could be happening. And then my egg popped up on the screen, and it hatched into a Togepi, one of my favorite Pokemon. I nicknamed it Toby and happily continued with the game. I trained it hard and eventually, at level 16, Toby evolved into a Togetic. I was so happy, and without him, I couldn't have defeated the Ecrotic Gym Leader. But soon, I started catching new Pokemon. And eventually after catching a Raikou that I'd been trying to catch for two weeks, I put Toby in a box and never really did anything with the level 21 Togetic. A week later, I defeated Gym Leader Claire, caught Lugia and headed to the Elite Four. 
I lost on the first try. So I thought of making a stronger team. I scrolled through the boxes and found Toby, adding him to my team. On the second try, I lost again because of my weak team. I decided to put Miss Drevis, Clefairy and Toby back in a box. But when I tried to put Toby in the box, a text box came up saying, Toby doesn't want to go to the PC. I tried again, yet another text box came up. Toby wants to stay with you. I tried again. This time, the text box said, Toby put the rest of your team in the PC. When I got back to the overworld, we were in Ecritique, next to the gym. I was confused and decided to go to the Pokemon Center to get Lugia to fly me back to Elite Four. A text box came up when I tried to withdraw my Pokemon. It said, Toby pulled you away from the PC. I was scared. I didn't think this was supposed to happen. I tried to save and quit, but the text box came back. Toby kept you from saving. At this point, I was scared out of my mind. I tried to reset, but this time Toby spoke to me. Why don't you love me anymore, master? I tried to reset again. Why did you store me away in a little box in a computer? Toby clearly didn't want me to reset, and even when I tried to leave my DS lying on the floor to go do something else, Toby said, Why don't you love me? I tried running away from my DS skin, only for Toby to say, Remember when you hatched me? You were so happy. We trained together and loved each other. Without me, you couldn't have defeated the gym leader. Then you caught that hideous Raikou and left me behind. How could you? Then a text message popped up and it said, Do you love Toby? Yes or no? I started crying and selected yes. Toby doesn't believe you. Toby ran away. I started to cry even harder. Toby, no! I shouted. A text box came up. Go to burn tower, it read, without punctuation. I hesitated, but I ran to burn tower. When I climbed to the top, I saw Toby, but he looked different. His eyes were pitch black with tiny red pupils, and he was crying bloody tears and had scratches all over him. Toby, I shouted. I don't care for you, Toby said. But I care for you, Toby, I shouted through the mic. You are one of the best Pokemon I ever will and ever have had. I will always love you. Nothing will change that. Toby started to speak. You... you do? Toby then returned back to normal. He ran to my character sprite and hugged it. I... I love you too, Master. The screen went black. It came back up as I was near the entrance to Victory Road. I checked my Pokemon, Bayleaf. I gave it Neverstone, Gyarados, Raikou, Furret, Lucia, Dratini, and something amazing. I had a seventh slot. In that slot was Toby. I didn't want to go, but sometimes... Life is too short for a few of us. I went to school every day, except for the weekends. I enjoyed class. I enjoyed befriending Pokemon. But I was never told about the dangers. It was on a normal Alolan school day. We were learning about ghost types. Someone must have left the front doors open because a balloon came floating in. It had a round purple body and white fluff on top of its head and a yellow X and two small black eyes on its head as well. There were two black strings that hung from its body, which at the end each had a yellow heart. It was adorable. Rifloon? It cried in a cute manner, gliding around the room. The teacher smiled. Plus, it seems we have a surprise visit. This is Drifloon. Drifloon cried with glee. Drifloon. 
The teacher offered it her apple, which it delightfully ate, enjoying the snack. Then it waved goodbye and left the classroom. I thought the Drifloon would make a wonderful friend. Later that day, when I got home, I ran up to my mother. Mum, I asked, can I bring an apple to school every day? My mum, seeing nothing wrong with it, said that I could. I squealed so loudly, I thought the glass would shower. The next day, I had written a note in the best handwriting that I could do that would let the Drifloon know that I had left an apple for it. I placed the letter down next to the steps, then put the apple on top of it so it wouldn't be blown away. During the entire day, I would gaze out onto the window, hoping to see the Drifloon. I saw it in the shadows of the trees when I left, so I waved happily to it, smiling. It seemed to like that. The next day, someone brought in a hypno. Whether it was wild or not, I don't remember. It looked a little scary though. During recess, I saw Drifloon again and happily walked over to it. Drifloon let out a cheerful cry, doing a little dance in the air. We were having fun together until the hypno walked by, waving its pendulum. I began to feel sleepy, but I was shook awake when Drifloon suddenly grabbed me by the hands with its strings. It then lifted me up into the sky, so high that I refused to look down. I heard Hypno's panicked shrieks along with my classmates before everything went cold and dark. I woke up back at the school classroom, at my desk, seeming okay. I thought that maybe it was a bad dream, so I silently waited for the bell to ring. When it did, I noticed everyone who came in had a sad expression on their faces. This was confusing for me. When I called out to the teacher, she ignored me like I didn't exist at all. As if I were a ghost. Everyone acted this way, even the janitor. I was starting to hate this. Hey, I'm still here. Hello? I yelled, but no response came. I walked home to my mother because I knew that she would comfort me. But she had the same expression. And she was... Crying. I walked over to hold her hand, but as soon as my hand reached hers, it went right through it. My eyes widened. Am... Am I a ghost? Did, did I die? I felt tears well up and ran back to the school crying. I curled up in the corner, tears streaming down my face. And then, I heard a familiar cry. Drifloon? Drifloon floated over to me, having a somewhat sad expression. It embraced me in its strings, hugging me. I calmed down and then hugged it back. If I were dead, then Drifloon would be my friend forever. A long, long time after, as I was standing in front of the smooth rock that had text engraved in it, a trainer came by the school at night and he talked to me. I'd heard of seven rumors, but I don't know the seventh one. I told him the other six though. One of the rumors was just Hypno's illusion. He told me it said, I, Griff, Loon, Child, Lonely. When he was done proving the rumors false, as he was talking to me, a voice rang out. Hey! You over there, what are you doing this late at night? The old janitor, now security officer, walked over. The boy looked back to us, but we were not there. What's wrong? The security officer asked the boy. The girl, the boy responded, but didn't know what to say. The man laughed. Seven mysteries, right? Everybody talks about them, but you were alone. Now I'll wrap up my patrol. You can go home now. He then left, and the boy walked out, glancing back one last time at the school. Thank you for listening to the end. If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to click that like button. And if you haven't already, 
make sure to subscribe and tap the bell icon to make sure you never miss a story.